Hey everybody, thank you for joining us for today's episode of Real Estate Disruptors. Welcome to our new studio, by the way. Today we have my good buddy Nathan Brooks with Bridge Turnkey, and he flew in from um, St. Louis, Kansas. no, Kansas City, Kansas City, Missouri, to talk about how he's flipped 700 houses in the last seven years. If this is your first time tuning in, I'm Steve Trang, sales trainer, and we help hundreds of people every single month buy more houses at deeper margins. I am personally on a mission to create 100 millionaires. Question I get all the time is how to become one of the 100 millionaires. The information on this, pack, on this podcast alone is enough to help you become a millionaire in the next five to seven years. If you will commit to taking consistent action, I promise you will become one. And the show is brought to you by Investor Lift. So if you want to get access to 2 million cash buyers across the country, go to InvestorLift.com, put in Disruptors to get 10% off. And if you get value out of the show today, please tag it from below, share this episode right now. That way we can all grow together. And as a friendly reminder, this is a live show. We record every single Wednesday at 2 p.m. Arizona time. We are the redheaded stepchild, so we don't change with daylight savings. And we are hiring. So if you guys are interested in working with us, please send me a message. We are actively looking to bring in more people to join our organization. This is a live show, so please ask your questions for Nathan to answer. You ready? Yes, sir. Let's do it. All right. So first question is simple, is what got you into real estate? What got me into real estate? Well, I remember uh, I played music professionally for like 10 years. Uh, so I got out of school. Uh, 10 years. 10 years, yeah. So a decade. I played music both in the sac secular and uh, sacred world. So big church stuff and, you know, rock and rowdy bands. But uh, I was hearing on the radio at the time about the Robert Kiyosaki and Rich Dad Poor Dad. So I went to seminar and I was like, <laughs> mind blown what people were talking about. And so I was literally sitting at lunch with my wife and overheard a, a guy talking about real estate. And I walked up to him and three weeks later I was in business with him, which was also the worst business partner I have ever had, to be clear. Well, you, you partnered up with the very first person you met. <laughs> yes, but I did take <laughs> massive action, Steve, but um, it was not my best decision. But um, yeah, that's how I, I literally, uh, I, I was reading, but I just, I was kind of looking for that, the channel to, to get into it. Yeah. And uh, man, so I, I took action. So massive action, took which is something that I absolutely believe in. Yes. Uh, so when was this? Um, this was like 2005. 2005. So yeah. you've been playing for 10 years, uh, yeah. making a lot of money on tours or? No, I was kind of, I was, I was making enough between like doing uh, lessons. So I, I play guitar, play piano, play bass. So I could teach a few different instruments mm -hmm. and um, so playing in bars and stuff. And then I, pl I had some church gigs as well, which, you know, it was an average salary at best, let's yeah. say. Right. Um, so it just, I wasn't, I wasn't receiving the, the time that the money value of the time that I was yeah. spending. Were you traveling to I was traveling to uh, doing, doing events, playing, you know, and bigger events as well as doing you know local stuff too yeah um, and the reason why i'm asking is right because like you, you most people you have a job and they're like oh my god i hate my job this gotta be something better yeah or um you know like should i go to college or should i do this you already have gone down your career route but it was a non-traditional career route yeah uh you're doing something which i imagine is your passion for you to, to, to do it for 10 years you're passionate about it yeah for sure so what what, what was it about rich dad poor dad or, or the mindset that compelled you to you know change directions for sure well I <clears throat> I saw the opportunity and and understood for the first time where I was tired of being broke so playing music is awesome but when you when you're doing something that you love to do but it's not creating the life that you want uh, I was like I have to make a change and so uh, when I saw the real estate and, and started to understand it and just you know wrap my brain around it at the very beginning which to be clear you know I, I didn't really understand that much but I I was I was bound and determined to figure it out and so as I could you know calculate okay what does it look like if I flip a house and I make you know 20 grand which is you know a third of what I'm making in a year in one transaction well, hey, that's a big deal right and so you know you extrapolate out what that creates uh, and and so I was I was just highly motivated by it so you you learned about it mm -hmm. did you go like you know, did you go to an event or did you just read a book and then just got a partner? Like, what was your... In the beginning, I really just kind of jumped in and uh, it did not go very well. 
so this guy uh, going through a divorce at the time, which I didn't really realize, and uh, basically ended up using this bank that was kind of more like a, a mob bank than it was like a, you know. Uh, so this was pretty much a disaster. I bought a number of houses, and he, he stopped showing up. He was supposed to be the guy that knows construction. And so I'm like hiring people from like the day labor pool and trying to solve. Which you already understood how to do really well when you were talking <laughs> to those guys. <laughs> it's a disaster. <laughs> it's a complete disaster. So um, a lot of people that, you know, we, we've heard is like they'll they'll go through the semester, not semester, the seminar route, right? And they'll spend yep. five, 15, 30,000, 60,000. And then they have to undo all that damage financially, you know, yeah. when they're getting started. And there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, that's just whatever. That's just something that happens to some people. For sure. So you went down the let's partner up, which other people do, yep. which I generally don't recommend when you're starting. Um, but you went down the partner route. Yeah. How much do you think that potentially costed you or, or or were you able to measure from going that direction? Well, you know, it cost me quite a bit because I ended up going through bankruptcy in 2009. Uh, so and it was, you know, kind of a culmination of of bad decisions and also mm -hmm. not having, you know, more money in the bank and some things that I just, you know, all in, all in, all in, all in, and, and not really, you know, having the, like you talked about, you go to a seminar, you might, you have a lot more tools, but you spend a lot of money doing it, mm -hmm. or you hope you have a lot more tools. Yeah. And um, so in that, in that case, I, I didn't have all the tools, but I went through like the, the classic school of hard knocks that's, you know, my education was with some pain. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so if you were able to go back and talk to, you know, Nathan back in 2005, yeah. what were two or three bits of advice you would give him? Man, slow down, uh, be more clear in what the outcome is I want from the beginning. Mm -hmm. And, and then I would say, you know, don't lose the, the passion to go after it. Yeah. So have a little more education, have more clarity of focus where the where the point of impact is. Mm -hmm. um, and because I, I bought stuff, you know, that were, you know, flips and I bought stuff that, w that were, uh, you know, Section 8 rentals and stuff that, you know, now I would I would never do. Um, but I just didn't know because I didn't have a clear plan of what I actually want to create. I was just like real estate. OK, well, can I buy it? Yes. Figured it out. So let me ask you this. Right. Because you say slow down. Mm -hmm. um, one of the biggest obstacles for most people that get started in this business is that they're going too slow mm -hmm. right and so like there needs to be something kick them in the butt they need some sort of fire and most people don't have it and just truthfully most people just don't have that fire right um so you've got that fire and you want to bring it in a little bit yeah but i mean i i think that you have obviously had to declare vk so those are massive mistakes right uh but m more often i think that you'll have more success if you go too fast and fix than go too slow yeah. And have nothing to fix. Yeah. Well, I would say even like now in my business, uh, I still have a tendency sometimes to see something and go at it too fast and just because I get excited and then I, you know, I leave my team behind. Mm -hmm. And, you know, part of the, the, the purpose of having a team is so that they can, you know, help carry the load and understand what you're trying to create. And so, you know, what I found was, hey, if I slow down a little bit, I, I have more clarity of what I'm trying to create with it. And then I can go fast because you know, the, the maximum slow is smooth, smooth is fast. Um, we understand it and then we can create it. Where did that saying come from? You know, I, uh, I heard it the first time, I believe in Jocko Willink's book, Extreme Ownership or on his podcast. Yeah. Uh, but I love the, of the line. Uh, cause we're gonna talk about martial arts in a little bit. Yeah, uh, yeah. uh, but that's something I learned from my Kung Fu instructor, right? Slow, smooth, smooth, smooth is fast. And mm -hmm. Right, you can just learn to do it the right way, and then you can do it really well the right way later on. Yeah. And I asked him, I was like, you know, he said he heard it from the, the, the military. Um, but you know, going back to the wish you would have slowed down a little bit. Um, there's a book, Keith Cunningham, uh, The Road Less Stupid. Have you read it? I haven't. No. It's okay. one of my favorite business books. So I highly recommend you check it out. Okay, I will. Uh, but one of the things he talks about in there is like, if we never made a mistake ever, like if we ran our entire business, right, you just look back. You start in 2005. You just look back in the last 17 years. Yeah. And you've made zero mistakes. How wealthy would you be today? I would be insanely wealthy. Right? Yeah. Could you, could you, I mean, you probably are able to retire today, but would you have been able to retire just a little bit sooner? For sure. Right? Yeah. And so that's what he talks about is like, not necessarily stop, but just inflection points. Just take a second, 
think about it. Is this what I want to do? And then take the massive action. Yeah. And well, it's, it's hard for myself to do this thing. It is. And I think that's the thing when you look at people and uh, I'm not sure, you know, a lot of, a lot of the companies and I'm not sure if you guys use it, but um, use, you know, various um, you know, types of personality profiles or mm-hmm. whatever. And uh, it, I'm, es- it's escaping me right now, but predictive I'm, a, index. I'm a ma- predi- predictive index yep. and I'm a maverick. I, I don't know. Are you a maverick? Are you, I'm an individualist. You're an individualist. I don't get along with anybody. <laughs> That's not true. Uh, but th- thinking about, you know, you have a room full of these people when you go to a mastermind or you go mm-hmm. to whatever and everybody's getting excited and h- how many deals we can do and what are these ideas we can do. And, uh, and what I realized was that just wasn't helping me solve. Mm-hmm. So, but I could understand more now the person, my personality and that I, w- I was in my nature to do that. Yeah. So let's talk about that, right? So, cause you, you've had the opportunity along the way, gain some wisdom, mm-hmm. self-reflection, yep. understand that you're a maverick, yep. which is by default competitive. Yes. And the best way to motivate you or one of the best ways to inspire you is to show you someone else is doing really well yeah and you're like i gotta catch that guy mm-hmm. so that combined with uh go as fast as possible i mean what going back to you saying you, you wish you would have slowed down a little bit like can you talk about like the the exercises you need to to rein that in yeah for sure well i i've i've really worked in the last couple of years on i have a, a daily journal practice daily meditation practice uh and then reflection on what it is that I'm trying to create in my life. And I, I, I laid out in three, three columns or three, you know, every quarter I look at it and I do it in business, personal and professional. And so in the, in the business, if it's, you know, this year we want to build X number of houses in Kansas city. Uh, that means that, Hey, I have to think about, can my team also do, you know, a podcast or do your strength you realize it's also your weakness, right? Moving fast. hundred percent. And like, it's interesting. Cause again, like I have another friend, you know, he was talking about his podcast uh, on an episode. Like he was talking about how he's really happy where he's at right now with balance in his life and so on. Mm-hmm. And his struggle is the whole things in. And someone was asking me like, is he cause he's complacent? Is it cause he's made it? It's like, no, like I know this guy very well. Like his internal drive is so strong mm-hmm. that he actively has to regularly Hone in and like that's his practice. This is his meditation, his Zen, whatever is to actively slow himself down. Hmm. So, uh, you mentioned earlier, right? You're going all in, all in, all in. Yeah. Is that a, was that a mental thing or was like a financial thing? Well, I think that it was kind of that broke mentality mm-hmm. uh, is I didn't grow up in a family that had money. We, we weren't poor, but we, you know, we didn't have money and didn't have really financial education, not in the way that I, I would, I try with my kids anyway, and no knock on my parents, they did the best they can do, right? Um, but so I, in the beginning was just like, I wanna make more money. Uh, and, I, and so I think that I didn't, the only regulator was how fast can I buy houses and what is my opportunity and not, you know, what is the cost? Um, what is the potential downside? Mm-hmm. And you know, in, um, in Money Mastering the Game, the Tony Robbins book, it was interesting because I can't remember which hedge fund, um, uh, you know, CEO, whatever that's talking about, but he, in that book, they talked about the f- number one thing that they look at is not how much they can make, but how, what is the risk compared paired to uh, their downside and mm-hmm. how do they protect the downside of that? Was it Ray Dalio or Warren Buffett? I think it was, it might've been Ray Dalio. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, it, it's cause um, that is a question I very rarely ask, like, you know, what can go wrong? Yeah. <laughs> I was like, oh, what can go right? Oh, what's the upside? Well, and that was the thing. And like, you know, so if you have a tenant that doesn't pay and you don't have any money in the bank and you were expecting to pay your mortgage with the rent, now you have a problem. Right. You know, and, and so, uh, and I, I didn't buy well. I remember, here's another great lesson. Um, I bought a number of houses and did not do an inspection because I did not have the cash to do it. <laughs> so uh, for anybody listening, don't do that. Uh, and so, you know, there were all kinds of issues. One of them was a section eight, uh, house that the lady was literally moving out the day that I, I closed on the house. So I was spe- expecting to have this, you know, built in rent. And, uh, and also I hated dealing with section eight tenants mm-hmm. and, uh, it's, you know, great for some people, whatever, but, uh, the ones that I had, the properties I bought were not great. And, uh, so, I mean, I just made so many, you talk about like one, one bad decision. There's so many bad decisions in there. And, uh, 
but in that case, I, I learned it. I learned it the hard way. Yeah. Well, one of the reasons I was bringing up the, the all in thing is that there are so many people that, and I, I put myself in this category as well, right? In, in early part of our career, is we think we got to grind, we got to grind, we got to hustle, right? We got to put everything in. Like I can't afford to pay myself right now. Now is not the time to, uh, to to feed myself, take care of myself. Now is the time to grow the business. Yeah. And unfortunately, if you have that mindset. You will never find a time to pay yourself. And one of the biggest things for me, you know, when when whole thing with COVID struck, was as an entrepreneur. Like what I was saying to my wife, and no one, I think, as society cared. But what I was saying to my wife is, I feel bad for all my fellow entrepreneurs who are saying like, this is the, you know, one day I'll get paid, one day I'll get paid. I'm gonna sacrifice, sacrifice, sacrifice. Mm. And one day we'll be able to celebrate. And when COVID struck, all those people were like been sacrificing for five, 10, 15, 20 years. Those dreams are crushed, crushed. right? Cause they had no savings cause they've been grinding yes. for all this time. And it's a broken mindset, I think. I think that the, the grind mentality, cause it, at the end, what, when you grind something, you destroy it. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, you know, I, I like, I like to think about it in bursts, um, just like in martial arts or just like in, um, in sprinting or whatever, like there's a beginning and an end. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it's not, it's not the, the whole motion is not about grinding. It's, right. You're killing yourself. So we haven't talked about your very first deal. Very first deal. So what was your very first? I mean, did you, you, you partnered with this guy. I imagine you guys did a few deals together before it's, you guys went separate ways. Oh, uh, well, the first day I bought, I did my first deal. I bought two. Okay. So hit it hard. Hit it hard. Shocking. Uh, with this partner and uh-huh. within like a week or two, he stopped showing up. So like I would show up at his house and he'd still be there, uh, but he wouldn't like answer the door. So I was trying to manage these two projects that I just bought on. I have no He's like idea. a difficult tenant. Oh yeah. Worse. Because now I'm in business with it. <laughs> uh, so yeah, that it, it was, it was about the worst possible way it could go. But at the time they also had, you know, the 80, 20 loans you could get. Mm-hmm. And so I, uh, you want to elaborate what that is for everyone that's listening? Yeah, for sure. So you could have, uh, basically the, the first 80% was a regular mortgage and then they would put in a second mortgage. So, um, in effect you had a hundred percent mortgage. Now the second would typically be a higher interest rate. Uh, but, um, yeah, you could basically buy anything, uh, which, which was, which was, uh, in my case, not necessarily good. Right. Uh, but, um, yeah, it was a disaster, man. The, uh, those two deals took forever and, um, and but were they easy to find was there any kind of marketing did you take anything you learned or were you just like one MLS is like all right I'm buying houses put these two under contract he had already known about those two Got so it. I didn't do any marketing I didn't know so the the, the homes after that I did uh, and bought like a group of four or five rental houses that um, this guy was selling and um, and those were the section eight ones that were also the disaster. So it was kind of like disaster on the first two and disaster on the next, uh, several as well. So, so how long did this go on with him? Uh, well with the partner, eventually I f- fired him out of there. Uh, but, um, those houses still, you know, I ended up putting like renters in them and instead of selling them and, and, uh, it, it didn't go, it didn't go well. And, and I really didn't learn that lesson honestly until, I was, you know, years later, I still owned those ho- homes. Uh, I had tried to do like seller finance and had there's issues in selling them. And um, so I really, I mean, I had those up until bankruptcy and they were a part of that. Okay. And, um, so did you have to give them back then? As part I had of to give them back, yeah. So okay. I, I followed chapter seven and I don't remember exactly how many houses there were, but it was about a million dollars value at the time of the, that portfolio. Did so, you have any equity when you had to do that? I did. Yeah, I did have equity. Uh, but chapter seven, for people who don't know, it's basically you take all your monopoly chips and you put them in. So everything that you have, you yeah. have to put it in. So all your assets, all your liabilities. Here everything. you go. Yeah, you have to just put them all in. And uh, yeah, it's, it's scary too. You sit sit in front of a person trustee who's, you know, their sole job is to try to find out any assets that you have or anything that you have. And uh, and it's terrible. So don't do that. Yeah. So you're, uh, you, you got... Like it's like a receiver, like the trustee. Well, the trustee, yeah. So the trustee works with the court, and basically their responsibility is to look at your case and say, okay, well, anything else that you have. And I remember at the time too, because I was playing music still, mm-hmm. you know, and um, I own you know a couple of guitars, and I'm like, hey, this is still how my I make my living, um, and uh, because at the time I was still doing both of those things, and uh, so you know, just having terror around this 
you know, thousand dollar instrument that at the time was, you know, a small fortune for me. So you had to give that up too. I did not. Thankfully, I I was able to keep those, but you know, I just remember, you know, sitting there and and being in a space of like, how did I, how did I create this? But what are, what are the lessons like immediately? What are the lessons I can learn from going through bankruptcy to not ever be here again? So would you say that's the bottom of your journey? You know, there's been some tough times. Uh, I think hiring, I think once you scale like beyond yourself, there's there's difficult times like mm-hmm. if you have hiring and firing. But I would say it was it was like the renaissance to my the creation of what I really wanted. Got it. So um, for a lot of the people, right? Because there's when we're when we're entrepreneurial, like everything's gonna be perfect, right? It's gonna be sunshines and butterflies and everything like that, right? Right. But you get punched in the face in this business regularly a lot. Yeah. So what were some of the things that helped you get through it? Well, I think that there's an, a combination. It, you can decide whether you're going to figure out a solution or not. Mm-hmm. And all the time, if you're someone who's willing to be thoughtful and creative in how to solve a problem, not like, what am I going to do? But what are we going to do to solve the problem? Mm-hmm. And it's a subtle, you know, thought process difference, but you give yourself the opportunity. Well, Chris Foss, right? We, we know with, with Chris Foss and his awesome book, Never Split the Difference, like you give the opportunity to even ask it as a question, like, what are we going to do about it? Mm-hmm. Like, um, and, and so I think it's, it's one of those things. If you, if you make the decision that you can solve a problem, uh, you can. And then the second thing is, is having a positive mental attitude and being able to work through a problem because when we get in an emotional state, we're not in a powerful state. Yeah. And so if we continually go to an emotional state, we're losing, we're, we're taking our power away. Yeah. I think, uh, Tony Robbins has a, a segment on this. I want to say it was like personal power too. One of those, you mm. know, uh, something I recommend for everyone. If you guys haven't checked it out, it's 30 days of, of, of mental exercises. But you know, if you stop asking why is this happening to me to how am I going to get myself out of this? Yes. Two questions that give you totally different outcomes and answers. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and, and and how beautiful is that? When you all yeah. of a sudden you realize the question that you're asking is is it producing the result that you want? Right. Or to, can it does it have the capacity to give you the, the results that you want? Exactly. All right. So, um, were there any other things you had an opportunity to f- figure out? Like how'd you got your, how'd you get yourself in the situation? Were there any other lessons there for people that are listening? Yeah, there's a lot of lessons. You know, I think uh, was the focus on what I what I wanted to do, what I want to create. All right. So clarity of purpose. Clarity of purpose for sure. Um, having more actual liquidity as I approach deals. And I know, you know, a lot of people, if you're just starting out, you're like, well, I don't have any money. Well, just you know, thinking about what that pacing looks like and what does it actually cost you as you have this mortgage and, you know, have a couple months of, of liquidity to pay for that. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I'll give an example too. I have a buddy of mine, Dan, who I was on a hunting trip with uh, be- beginning of, I think it was last year. And he, uh, wanted to do real estate and he was fired up and uh, he's, he was looking at some building to buy it. And I started asking him a series of questions and he said, you know, come to find out not only did he not really have any liquidity, but he was you know, 25 grand in the hole on a credit card. And I was like, dude, you can't do that. Like, don't do that. This is, mm. this is bad news, but he wanted it. And so in 11 months, he not only paid off that credit card making 55 grand a year in his job because he kept taking side jobs and, and they hustled uh, but they paid off their car and they're on a totally different trajectory. Yeah. It's like, how bad do you want it? So right. write it out. How bad do you want it? What is it that this creates for you? And so I wanted it bad. <laughs> and I was like, we're going to figure this out and we're going to make it about uh, this being a part of the life that actually creates what we want and not just, you know. So now that you've created a clarity of purpose, what was that purpose? Yes. So the purpose for me was to have fun doing things what I like, what I love in my life. And if it, and uh, if it is not something that is really awesome and exciting for me personally, I'm not doing it. Yeah. Um, so if that's in, in my personal life, whether it's playing music or doing crazy stuff or hunting, uh, or, you know, spending time with my family too, where if you're spending every day, all day working, you're not spending the time. Yeah. And so I wanted to have a fulfilled life in all of those categories, personally, professionally, and in, in my family too. Yeah. And I think this is a great exercise, right? I mean, I think for everyone that's listening, like so many people say, I want to do this many houses a month. I make this much revenue per year, this and that. And I think all that 
is great, mm -hmm. but it's not purposeful. No. And it doesn't get you out of bed, right? Like when things are bad, it's like, oh, I want to go buy two more houses, right? It's, but I think going through the exercise, right? If I can buy this many houses or I can make this much money per month or per year, it's like, okay, what can I do with that? Yeah. Why, do, why is that so important once you figure out the purpose? Yeah. Well, and you can almost invert those two also, right? When you can say, well, hey, I, I actually want to spend more time hanging out with my kids or, you know, traveling. Uh, and how much money do I really need to make to create that? Mm -hmm. And a lot of times I think we, we still trade time for dollars. We just trade time for more dollars. Right. Uh, and so it, ultimately, are you really, are you really wanting to trade that with your life? And uh, so for me, it was, it was a definite no, but you know, as you go on that entrepreneur's journey, it's easy to get sucked back into that. And he's like, oh, well, I made a hundred grand in a day, or I, you know, flipped 700 houses, which sounds awesome. Uh, but, you know, you can still lose what it is that you really uh, want to do. And, and that can change over time too. If yeah. you're not purposeful with spending that time in meditation and journaling and coming back to that question. Yeah. So what was the first thing, the first step you took in, getting out of that hole you were in, right? You, you just finished, you just filed BK, you're at the bottom mm -hmm. or worse. Yeah. What was the first thing you did to get yourself out of that hole? I just spent time reading and looking and, and learning. Mm -hmm. How can I do a better job of going into this? And I also sought out for the first time really a mentor. His name is Rob, who's still crushing it in South Florida right now. Um, he's not really on the map. People, you know, he's not out there in social media blowing it up, but he, he owned, he was kind of the, the, the guy that first laid it out for me. And so it's a couple of years later and I'd still been reading and still been, you know, thinking about real estate, but I harassed him to finally go to lunch. And I remember mm -hmm. like, well, I mean, I'm offering you pay, pay for lunch. Like, why don't you, you know, I can barely, you know, think about paying for a $20 meal, let alone, but, uh, I didn't really understand it at the, at the time. Mm -hmm. I certainly appreciate that now. Um, but um, finally got him to go to lunch and he for the first time laid out like this is my brokerage and this is my property management business and this is my rental portfolio and this is how we lend money out of my IRA and it was like it was the, the epiphany moment where I could see for the first time what a real business looked like right and uh, and he was also the first lender on my very first post bankruptcy house which I literally just sold like a month or two ago 5005 Harmony and it, uh, that house it was like, I just distinctly remember finally, like I, I now understood better how to underwrite a deal, how to walk it with a, a contractor. I had an inspector that I, I, I worked with on every house. And all of a sudden I started to have a method to, the, to that and not just like, oh, there's a house, I can buy it. What is the method in which we approach and what area are we buying and what does the buy box look like and creating now a formula to have success with it. Yeah. So finding a mentor before jumping into the next house. Yep. Yeah. And it, it's, it's funny, right? Cause when you first started, right, going back to 2005, it's mm -hmm. almost Nathan, you can't buy anything to have a mentor. What would 2005 version of Nathan said? I mean, he would have thought that was crazy. And right? that was me, right? Like I, mean, I remember when I first went to a REIA event, uh, I can't remember it was 2007, 2008 and you know, cocky little, little me, um, I'd walk around. I was like, you know, what's this guy? 18% interest. Like, that's stupid. Why would anyone ever pay that? Right. Right. And this whole recession thing happened. And I, I, I was kicking myself in the butt cause like I see all this opportunity, mm -hmm. but I couldn't take advantage of it. Yeah. Right. Like I, if I had bought all those properties, man, who knows where I would be. Yeah. Um, but the answer was right in front of me. It was go get money at 18%. <laughs> right. You will ca literally cash flow. <laughs> if you borrow at 18%, right, at that time, but because I didn't have a mentor, because mm -hmm. I was wanting to do it on my own, and I didn't want to listen to anybody else, it, it, I saved myself money, but what did I cost myself in saving that money? It's, right. it's hard to know, right? And, and when I look back at that decision to, to do that, you know, I think part of, part of the lesson, part of the, ex was just the experience of doing it, mm -hmm. you know, and, and also the recognition that the more deals I've done, over my life, the more things I realize what I like doing too. Yeah. And, and when I'm not lined up in alignment with what I like doing, then I don't often do a great job. Yeah. But when I'm lined up with what I love doing, I do an awesome job because it's not work. You know, it's, right. it's fun. Well, it might be work, but I like doing it.
It doesn't feel like work. It doesn't feel like work. All right. So you got a mentor and now you just have a process. Yes. Did you still move pretty fast after you had the process or I mean, what, what were some of the steps? There to- were still hiccups. You know, I, I had one in particular that I remember, um, I had been a guest on the bigger pockets podcast. Uh, <laughs> I got lucky, I guess, um, that I'd done, an, uh, I don't know, maybe 20 or 30 deals at that point. And, um, so I started all of a sudden having this influx of opportunity to have partners. And, um, there was one deal in particular it was, it was a big house, big flip, big opportunity to make like, you know, hundred grand in this house. And, and, um, basically everything that could go wrong, you know, still went wrong. So, mm-hmm. you know, contractor quit and then they take forever. We found, you know, it's this two story, you know, 3000 square foot house and all the whole back of the house has to like come off and cedar shake that super expensive. And, uh, so we have, we just have issue after issue and, um, end up in a lawsuit with this, you know, person that I would had JV partnered on it. And, um, it's just a disaster. Yeah. And so, you know, I still had to learn what does it look like for Nathan to be a partner in it, in deals and also like what kind of house should I really bought that house? Um, and I think as people are, are, are listening, you know, as you, as you go for, you know, Hey, I'm going to do one house and do five houses and you know, you want to scale. Well, scaling still, you don't do scaling at the, at the cost of, of the of deals that you don't understand yeah and uh, that was a huge lesson for me in that what would um i guess at this time you're flipping houses right you're, yeah we we're flipping some as, so as well as keeping rentals when did you get to a point where you're flipping a lot of houses so in 2015 again thanks to the bigger pockets podcast um i had uh, my partner, who is still my partner to this day, David, um, sent me a message. They flew out, and um, we actually we just sold the house, the first house that we we bought together as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, but we met and and hung out, and it just had this you know um, incredible connection. And so we started buying houses uh, as a partnership, and I think 100, 150 houses a year. So, if I wanted to, you know, get in and start flipping at scale mm-hmm. well i guess let's talk about let's start flipping and then we'll talk about flipping at scale right uh so what are what's the first two or three things i need to do if i want to start flipping the way that you were flipping houses yeah so i think in our situation is understanding what that whole pipeline looks like and there's there's two different things there's the leadership management of that uh, at scale and then there's the actual process of it and so you know understanding who you are as a leader, what your roles and responsibilities are, and then whoever you have on your team, mm-hmm. what their roles and responsibilities are. So it comes to like, okay, in acquisitions, this is the kind of house that we buy. So we had to make it clear for our team in order to buy 150 houses, you know, how many offers do we have to make? What kind of house do we buy? Um, and, and then run through the whole process of saying, okay, now we hand it off to construction. We have a the same set of stuff that we do in every house. These these are the designs and uh, these are the colors, these are the palettes. And um, and make each one of those things as simple as possible. Mm-hmm. Because you know you can't have a bunch of other people who are doing stuff around you if they don't understand and you haven't created a process for what that looks like. Yeah. And I think a lot of entrepreneurs have a, have a hard time with that. Like the whole E-Myth book, right? And Michael Gerber talks about that um, at length in that book. So you're saying that before we start scaling in volume, and doing a lot of houses, we need to have a built out process map, really. Absolutely, yeah. Right, and and, and that's, uh, I know that's one of the hardest things, especially as an entrepreneur to do, because again, we're talking about most entrepreneurs, the challenge is not um, do something, right? If they've had any kind of success, the ch- biggest challenge is getting them to slow down. Yep. So. And for why, in the why behind it. Yeah. And that's where, you know, I think for a a long time I had trouble because I couldn't see why. Mm -hmm. And, and also giving the people around you, uh, the, the openness to give you feedback and to say like, Hey dude, we're going too fast. Like we can't keep buying houses. I I remember a phone call at one point, David, my partner, were like, we own 70 houses, but we were, you know, our capacity was really say 30 or 40 in the system at one time. And just, all of a sudden we have that many. And so even, you know, you have ch- these checks and balances as you, as you go and flipping five houses at a time is totally different than 10 and mm-hmm. 20. Uh, and so it, all those things have different, different breakpoints. Yeah. But I, I can imagine even 
for me, right? Like someone saying, Hey, you need to slow down and process map this. It's like, what the hell are you talking about? <laughs> what do you want me to do? Yeah. <laughs> but what we do is we buy the house, Steve, and then we flip it and then we sell it. Yeah. Like what Where's else you need? What else do you need? Right. <laughs> um, but when you have an organization, mm -hmm. right. Where you have people, especially, I think one of the best ways to sell this as an entrepreneur is like, look, do you want people calling you every time they need something or do yeah. you want them to not call you? Correct. Right. And so you're talking about having a process like, does this fit in our buy box? How do we know if it fits in our buy box? Yep. Like all these uh, processes, uh, check boxes, procedures, and it's irritating as all this can be as an entrepreneur to sit down and draw it out. It is, yeah. But the time it saves you and how happy your team is. A hundred percent. Well, and most people are not wired like that. Right. And so the people who are not wired like that, they don't operate with, oh, Nathan just said, go buy some more houses. They're like, well, what houses? And at what price point? And mm -hmm. so, you know, you do those things once and, and then you also have to say, all right, well, what is the training process for this too? So you can't just write, uh, write it out and process map it. It might be clear in your head, mm -hmm. but it's not clear to your team. Right. And so they have to understand. And then also have somebody that you can hand it off to that likes process. Uh, because those people, exist. I don't know why, <laughs> but, but those people exist out there. Mm -hmm. And uh, so have somebody that is awesome at it and likes to run a process. Yeah. So you're mentioning, you know, a person, right? So... Mm -hmm. Uh, Dan Sullivan published a book recently, Who, Not How. Such a great book. Yeah. So who are the people you need within your organization to run a bigger flipping business? Yeah. So uh, kind of to that same point of seeing the process, seeing and underst understanding what that looks like. I have, I know a lot of variations of this and a lot of our friends, you know, have variations of this business. But, you know, when you think about you have the acquisition side uh, and whether you have marketing like you guys do or, you know, we, we never really had a wholesale business. Mm -hmm. We never bought stuff off market. So we, we bought all those houses, uh, pretty much all, you know, from MLS and wholesalers. So you don't have to have that. It's awesome to have that. Mm -hmm. um, but um, something in acquisitions, uh, and then we, we had, uh, in our construction division, we had project management, we had estimator on staff, and a construction manager. And then um, we have transactions. So you have, have to have somebody that's, you know, managing the, those inflow of, of contracts and, and information. And I don't know what you guys use, but um, you know, we, we built our system out on Podio. So you also just have something that actually tracks all that data. And, uh, and then the sales and marketing. So what, what does the exit of those homes look like? And whether you're selling it to flip it or, you know, you're selling it on, on MLS or investor buyers are buying it as a rental. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, understanding each of those steps and then all the people that that touch and remember that you know you might have something on the back end they're like well hey wait were you buying this to sell it on mls or are we buying this um so that they need to interact with construction to know that we have the right designs and we have the right um outcome so there's a lot of moving pieces as you start yeah. to scale that so one thing you said that i haven't heard anyone else say is you need an estimator mm. what is an estimator so on our team we had an estimator so they would work really more uh, in between where acquisitions and construction was. So uh, once we would have the the uh, you know property under contract, we'd send the estimator out. So he he was very familiar with the project, but he wasn't just the acquisition guys who's like you know trying to ballpark a number. He would go in and actually build a whole scope out. And so from day one, by the time we would close on that house, we'd have a full blown uh, complete scope of work mm -hmm. and everything's already laid out and ready to rock so that by the time we closed on that house, um, you know, we're looking at every day that, that cost of money as that, as you're holding that asset. Um, so we would already be ready to go. So they would hand that off to the project manager. Got it. So, um, you mentioned earlier the importance of leadership, right? Mm -hmm. And I think leadership is one of the most important, if not the most important skill that we have as business owner. Yes. Um, but you mentioned it earlier as far as like building out a flipping organization, right? Most people, leadership is a skill that they acquire later on after they screw things up. Mm -hmm. So you're saying they need to work on that earlier or? A hundred percent. Okay. So expand on that. Yeah. So it, leadership, you know, I, is one of those things that I, I think it is greatly underappreciated and, and incredibly complex and difficult. And uh, in business, I think leadership and, and the management and um, leading of people is by far the hardest thing. Yeah. Buying houses is not hard. Yeah. Um, and I always say, don't make money. It's hard pay. initially. Yeah, 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 for but sure. But once you figure it out, yeah, 
It's autopilot. It's autopilot, yeah. And, and uh, most of the time, I think people make money their problem. And I, I, my, my maxim has always been, you know, don't make money your problem, make your problem your problem. Mm -hmm. like, what is the actual problem? But, you know, for leadership, you know, it's one thing to tell someone to do something. That's not leadership. Yeah. You know, we have it's to... management. Be, yes, could be. It's management. It's not leadership. Yeah. And, and even in management, you know, I think uh, of holding accountability too. Yeah. Like, what what is the accountability structure for that? But in leadership, you know, if you don't know who you you are, it's very hard to lead other people. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's not only, it's the self-exploration of who you are and what you want to create, but then also helping other people do that in their own autonomy, in their own space. Yeah. And, um, and you know, understanding what your style is, and not everybody's the same, but like in our business, we wanted to have, you know, people who have a lot of autonomy, they have a lot of space to operate, and that takes a lot of time, a lot of training, and a lot of building of trust and coordination of what you're doing. And so, you know, these things take time. Uh, it's not just a process, right? Because mm -hmm. process is not leadership, that's management. Uh, leadership is, is the building of relationship. Yeah, and you know, John Maxwell says, the hardest person to lead is yourself. Is yourself. Right, so you gotta lead yourself before you can lead others. Yes. And we haven't earned that privilege or the right to the others until we've learned how to lead ourselves. hundred percent. So what did you do to get better at leadership? You know, I am an obsessive person. And uh, <laughs> so once I discover something, I have to fix it. And, uh, and so for me, you know, it's been just constant reading, constant learning, joining masterminds, having, you know, quality conversations with people, doing podcasts, how do we learn? And then understanding like, okay, well, this thing failed, but why did it fail? Mm -hmm. And having a heart for, for learning. And, and then also, you know, I think a lot of times leaders have a hard time admitting they're wrong. And, you know, when we screw up, I remember there's such a great story in, in Extreme Ownership, Jocko Willink's book, where he, they have a blue on blue incident, which means, you know, the same side shooting at each other. Friendly fire. Friendly fire. And, um, you know, they, he asks who's responsible. And, you know, all the guys are saying, hey, it was me. I, I screwed it up or I did this or that. And he's like, no, it's my fault. I'm the leader and it's my fault. And I think when you can take ownership, you, you build trust and building trust creates opportunity to grow in that. And, um, and so as leaders, we have to be, we have to be uh, not only willing to talk, but we have to do a lot more listening mm -hmm. and a lot more learning. And, uh, and so, and there's so many great ways now and resources to do that between books and podcasts and, you know, mentorship, uh, masterminds, whatever. So I know you're a big Jocko fan. Huge Jocko fan. I am as well. My partner, Max is a huge, a big Jocko fan boy. So yeah. then I've been saying for a long time, right? Like John Maxwell is the guy's leadership. Mm. Put you on the spot here. Okay. Who's the guy for leadership? Is it Jocko or is it? I like them both a lot. Um, so I'm going to give you a non-answer, which is uh, I don't believe that either of them are the mm -hmm. one. And uh, because I think that, you know, Jocko can be pretty aggressive, default aggressive, right, uh, all, all the time. But and when you listen to him on a podcast, like sometimes you can tell like that dude is pretty intense when you know, he will he, rip your heart out. He will rip your heart out. Yeah. Uh, and then, you know, when you, you go, you know, read like a Dan Sullivan book, like who, not how. And I, uh, the, um, something, the gap, uh, which the gap in the game, the gap in the game, uh, you know, Dan Sullivan's name is first in the book, but he didn't write them. You know what I mean? But right. they're beautiful books and they talk you know, in a very different way mm -hmm. about, about leadership. And so, I don't think there's just one answer. I think that the answer is you are constantly learning about leadership, which means you're constantly le learning about yourself, you're constantly challenging yourself as a leader, and you're constantly checking, is it what we're, what's coming out of my mouth, what we're doing in the business, congruent with the thing that I'm trying to create? Yeah, and I think that's the key, right, congruence. Yeah, and the people who are on my team, the people who are around me, when they see me, and this is the biggest thing I've, I've started to get this a lot more lately, which somebody will say to me, Nathan, I love that you are spending time with your kids and I get to see you out fishing or hunting or whatever. Um, or somebody in the business like, Hey, thanks for giving me the opportunity to work on this project. I'm like, that was leadership mm -hmm. because I, I, it wasn't even about me and it's not about you yeah. as a leader. It's about you making it clear what, what, 
can happen, what you want to have happen, and then giving that space yeah. for people to do it. And you mentioned Mastermind. So we connected through Collective Genius. Yep. And it was through Collective Genius that I heard about the Way of the Warrior series. Oh, yeah. So, right. hey. so I had my kids go through it. They don't love me for it. So, they don't? So they don't love you for it either. <laughs> um, I'm sorry about that. They're so good. I, I made them read it, right? So they've yeah. gone through it. Um, but, you know, I think that, again, the, the connections, right, and the, the connections we make, uh, we get to also share it yeah. with our family. Our family gets to benefit as well. Absolutely. Um, so um, we talked about how to flip 700 houses in seven years, mm -hmm. but you are now going in a different direction. Yep. So what's the different direction? Yep. So, you know, there's a lot that goes into buying and flipping houses. And, I, and you and I both know lots of people who are who are very successful. Mm -hmm. And I think in in the spirit of what we've been talking about and clarity of focus and whatever, uh, I really was getting burned out on doing that many. And uh, and especially in the rehab side where you, you get into stuff and you don't know what it is uh, or you open up walls and you have issues. And so we've made a transition in our business really strictly into new construction and development now. And so we, we chose and make some really hard decisions about four or five months ago and, and basically let go of half our staff mm -hmm. um, in our business to, to put a sole focus on new construction and development. And, uh, and we knew that was the right call because, you know, for, for months, maybe even a year, uh, <laughs> we kind of fantasized almost about like, man, can you imagine if we were only building houses? And, um, and so we just time and time again, I was like, all right, this is the thing um, that we want to do. I'm passionate about it. I'm excited about it. And it is, you know, infinitely scalable. And so um, that's, that's the new direction. Got it. Um, yeah, it's, I'm not seeing any questions in here. So if you have any questions, please uh, post it here. And if you guys need any help with your business at all, send me a message on Instagram. And we'll connect you with someone on our team to answer whatever questions you guys have. So uh, what was interesting is we sent you a deal. We sold you a deal. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And, you know, we tried Kansas City for, I want to say, like all the three weeks. I'm like, ah, this place sucks. We're out of here. <laughs> right. And a month later, it's like, hey, we want to sell our house. It's like, oh, okay, great. So we send it to you. Right. And so Ruben on my team was working with you. Yes. And you want to share that conversation you had with him? Because it was, it was kind of a, when you shared with me, I thought that was kind of funny. Well, I, you might remember more details than I remember, but, um, yeah, I just remember him, him calling me and, uh, you know, you, you are a great sales trainer. Your team is uh, incredibly well, well, well trained and well versed in that. And I, I distinctly remember him using some, uh, some of the tactics in the Chris Voss, you know, never split the, uh, never split the difference, uh, when mirroring and, in um, uh, some other tactics. Yeah. So and, uh, what, what Ruben told me is like, um, you guys were having a, a, a negotiation, yeah. right? We were 5,000 apart. We wanted one number. He wanted, uh, we wanted one number. You wanted to pay a different price. Yeah. Right. And you guys are negotiating and he said, can I, you said to him, can I take a time out here? He's like, uh, what's going on? He's like, and you basically said more or less, I want to just take a moment to just recognize <laughs> like, how right. well of a job you're doing right now <laughs> in negotiating with me. Yeah. All right. Let's go back to negotiating. <laughs> that sounds like something I would say. Uh, yeah. Well, when I, when I hear those things, because I'm aware of it enough mm -hmm. now, you know, it's a subconscious thing in negotiation or whatever, but uh, when you hear those things, like what would it take to, or mm -hmm. it seems like Steve, you, you know, maybe you don't want to get this deal done. And, uh, and so it was, it was a cool moment yeah. uh, in celebration of, of obviously his skills and, and the learning he has from you yeah. and your team. Well, and, and, and the reason why I remember this, cause you and I were talking, I was like, you know, do you prefer to go by Nathan or Nate? Uh, and yeah. he said, Nathan and I was like when I when I heard it I said okay there was enough emotion there yeah so I I, I just kind of came back and said it sounds like there's a story there and then instead of going into the story which is normal right he said wait a minute <laughs> you just labeled me <laughs> so I love that I mean, that that demonstrates that a you've trained in, in this, yourself in this so much that you can recognize it mm -hmm. and then B I'm doing this so much I didn't even realize it yeah right and I remember I was actually at a restaurant in in Tampa. And, um, there was, we ordered, we were at Ruth, Chris, me, Pace, Jamil, and, and some other guys. And the server said, you know, like, here's the dessert that comes with the meal. Right. And I asked him, Oh, how do you like that? He said, it's good. Right. 
and I did the same exact thing. It's just it's an autopilot now. Of course. It's like good. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Sounds like you want to tell me <laughs> more about that. <laughs> and he's like, well, it's not my favorite. And he goes into this thing. I was like, well, then give me whatever you think is the best. Like, yeah. Don't give me whatever you think is is, is it, just because it comes with the, the meal. Like, don't we don't want that. Yeah. Yeah. Give me what is, is is the best thing you have here. And you know what's beautiful about that is that by the byproduct of that is also better communication mm -hmm. and better understanding. Yeah. So, you know, when something's not working, you can come back to yourself and say, well, what is the question I'm asking? Mm -hmm. And, uh, and it was the quality of your question. Yeah. Well, immediately I was like, oh man, I can't even turn this thing off. And, uh, and Pace and Jamil obviously had a good laugh at my expense, which is fine. It's great. You know what though? I, I love it because it's so useful. And, and for people who struggle with this, by the way, a great place to practice is at the grocery store. Yeah. I love nothing more than trying to get a discount on like the bread that I have in the, like, I'll just say, well, what does it take today? And I'll have my son, like, do you have a two good looking guy discount today? What is it going to take to get yeah. a little deal on this? D you will never see them again. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter. <laughs> There's nothing on the line. <laughs> Low risk. Low risk. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, I appreciate that. Uh, so on IG, someone was asking, uh, what was the hardest challenge that you face when you began flipping? Well, I think early on, the hardest challenge was was understanding the as we would hire people, it, that it was hiring and training of people. Because it's one thing for me to go and buy that house. I could walk it, I could price it, I could understand it, I could negotiate all those things. But as you scale, you cannot do all those things. At least you can't do them well. And so it was, it was the transition of going from doer to you know manager or leader of and so i'd say as people are thinking about you know scaling something you it it comes back to that process mm -hmm. and, and to be able to say all right this is actually our our coach gary harper right he so he'd say like um there's three steps it's i'll show you let's do it together and then you show me mm -hmm. and and for people when you know you take your time to do that to do that and don't expect the person to be able to you know, do it in six, six weeks, right? It's going to take time. And, um, and so you, you give them small pieces, give them a little more autonomy, give them small pieces. And, and uh, so the, t the time is so well spent on the front end for the, the uh, produces the result that you want on the back end. Yeah. Uh, one thing uh, I've seen you play around with is crypto. Yes. It's a little different than real estate. Yes, it is, for sure. What prompted you to get into crypto? Well, you know, uh, if I maybe mentioned earlier, I, I obsess. So if it gets on something that I'm like, man, I, I can't quite wrap my brain around. And to be clear, I have not 100% wrapped my brain around crypto by any stretch of the imagination. But um, I believe it to be something that is, it's going to be, when it is, world changing. Mm -hmm. um, it is, you know, dynastic changing, like in, in, the, in the world as far as, you know, c countries and um, who creates what and do they have an ecosystem um, and also when you look at look at from a very practical perspective of you know you can't keep printing money and have an inflationary market like sure that you can. Uh, it's transitory it's fine with, <laughs> without having other issues um and uh, and also just from i mean in history the whole time is you've <laughs> always been able to print money <laughs> to solve a problem it's true. yeah 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 you can print money and it does solve a problem that is true for a very short period of time for a very short period of time yeah 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 and when you when you uh, no longer have it uh, as the you know against gold and, mm -hmm. and um, the the value is just the value. But in any case, and and then also just you know from from a thing that is is interesting. Mm -hmm. And so um, you know I've been obsessing about it for for some time. But I, yeah. I made some very specific goals this year around crypto and and learning and investing. You feel comfortable sharing those? Yeah, goals? Yeah, one hundred percent. So I, I I wanted to go from the place of being like the guy that buys a. A coin on Coinbase or something like that to someone who is is an investor and uh, on the on the front end of those things. Mm -hmm. And so I finally met and connected with somebody who has helped me um, and incredibly to learn. And and so you know I made a goal of making a million dollars this year just in crypto. Yeah. And um, and so and just uh, for accountability's sake, I have I've made. Um, almost like, I think, fifty or sixty grand in the last two weeks in crypto. Nice. Yeah. So. While well, it's been going down. Correct. That's pretty well, good. And there's there's just a lot of different things you can invest in. Right. And so, um, 
you know, I, I've just been spending a lot of time in, uh, I am, I'm definitely the dumbest person in the, you know, various Telegram channels that are, you know, like 272 18 year old nerds and then me. Yeah. And, uh, but I'm down. And so I, uh, again, I'm, I'm, I'm humble enough to ask questions and I'm, I'm not afraid to, to take action. But now, you know, as a port of, a part of my, my net worth and a part of my portfolio, now I can, I can take a, a you know, fifty thousand dollar gamble, a hundred thousand dollar gamble, and and it's okay. Yeah. And, and so it's it's been well worth that. So I'm getting into it now. Like I bought a bunch of crypto last year, right? And I did absolutely nothing with it, you know. Uh, but I mean, this NFT thing is freaking on fire right on now. On fire, yes. And I do think that we're at a pivotal point in I mean, in our history. Absolutely. Right. And so there's two things I want to do, but I can get buy-in, right? Okay. Uh, so I got five younger brothers that are software developers. Oh my gosh. Right. I was like, well, guys, we should be, you know, a hundred percent working together to be creating NFTs. Uh, I've been in group text with them. Maybe I just need to hound them down and <laughs> lock them in a room, or whatever. Uh, but they're like, they're not interested. Like, there's this crazy opportunity for us right now. Like, we can do like the train gang or train brothers, whatever. Like, we could do something in uh, yes. zero interest. Um, and then, <laughs> but the other thing I was thinking about this last night is I think it'd be pretty cool as, as a family project, mm. right? Like, uh, I was thinking, you know, we could, uh, have my daughters just start instead of Minecraft and Roblox, I think that's yeah. what it's called. Uh, we're going to, I was like, I will fund them playing in the central land. Oh, love that. Right. And yeah. then I'm thinking like, this could be a whole new YouTube channel, right? Yeah. Just these kids, 10 to nine years old, playing on the central land and uploading YouTube and who knows where this goes. Yes. But we're monetizing it. They're learning about crypto. They're learning about, um, uh, investing in investing. General. Yeah. Right. Uh, so, running a business entrepreneurship. Like, so my 11 year old son, his name is Colin and I wore this Montana angler hat, by the way, and he really did not want me to leave. Uh, but, um, <clears throat> and if you hadn't caught yet, we, we spent a lot of time fishing together. Um, but, um, he is an obsessed little entrepreneur himself yeah. and not that little really anymore. But, um, so actually this week I opened his first wallet and he put a hundred bucks in, I put a hundred bucks in. And, um, and so he now is the proud owner of an NFT. He's the proud owner of, you know, some crypto as well. And, um, so a hundred percent in, in, as we see this unfold, we're going to realize that, you know, if you did not learn it, if you did not get into it, you will be left behind. And, and there'll be a lot of people that make a lot of money. And, uh, and also, you know, it, I don't know how far into the crypto thing you want to go, but I mean, there's not enough but, questions here. <laughs> uh, that I think, you know, from an NFT perspective, it's interesting because there's some that have utility and, mm -hmm. and there's some that are just, you know, pretty R work. And, uh, so when you look at also the projects, right, w what are the projects that are actually creating value? And, um, and so that's where I think it's hard for people when you start to look at it because you don't really understand like, what does this coin do? Mm -hmm. What does this NFT thing do? Um, and so, you know, starting to understand where does the value in crypto actually happen yeah. and what problems are people actually solving with blo blockchain technology and, and, um, and in the real estate world, right? So like transfer of ownership or mm -hmm. clear title or, yeah. you know, there, there's so many things or even like an NFT of a house. Like how, how does that, how can you create value where uh, maybe there's not something that is right now? Yeah. I'm actively investigating how we can use uh, blockchain and, and title. Um, all right, so uh, Fix, Phoenix Native, what, pers what advice would you give a young person who wants to get into real estate today? Uh, I would say that uh, no matter what it is, like no matter how old you are or what story you're telling yourself, you actually start with what that is first, mm -hmm. which is I can be successful. This is what I want to create. And start with literally what it is that you want to create because I think when you look at people right now, uh, and you think about COVID and, and all the things that people have gone through, how many people are still like, um, deaths and, and serious, um, health issues are caused right now a lot by like, issues of despair, like, uh, and, and <laughs> mental health and alcohol and all these things and people, no matter where they are in their, in their life, they have not necessarily created what it is that they wanted to, mm -hmm. which is why they're upset. Right. And so when you start your business and you start what it is that you're creating, 
Start with what you want it to actually look like. Yeah. And I think most people don't think about it. And how much money do you want to make? And of course, in five years or two years or whatever, it might be different, and that's totally cool. But what do you actually want to do? And and I think so many people spend so much time thinking about making money. Mm -hmm. It's just one thing. Yeah. Instead of like, what do I want my life to look like and actually have joy in what I do? So clarity of purpose, you know, which is something we said earlier. Yeah. Um, and I, I, don't know, I, I don't know about 100% agree, you know? Okay. I think I think that clarity of purpose is absolutely critical because once you make enough money, then there's no excitement, right? Like, sure. There's enough money in the bank account. Like, why are you getting up? Why are you making that extra call that you didn't want to make? Yeah. Right? Um, I think that there's there's an element of survivorship right like you know you gotta get past the survival point mm. right because survival is a purpose it's not clear right sure. but it's, it's instinctive yeah right but I, I would say you know and I, I'd, I love the disagreement I think in this case if you know it, it, like to use my my life as an example if I would have had more clear purpose it doesn't mean don't take more act don't mm -hmm. take the same action it just means take action in the clear right so I, I've shot a rifle at a thousand yards and hit a target an 11 inch group which would uh, you know make me qualify for sniper school right so so don't piss off nathan <laughs> you pull the trigger on something and the movement of your hand adjusts the 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 you know dynamic of the barrel right and at a short distance doesn't make much difference but at a thousand yards that bullet drops you know 40 40 50 feet and if we think about more clearly what our target is uh, just a little bit further, I feel like we can make such a dynamic difference in the outcome. So it's not that I don't believe that we shouldn't take action, because that would be my very next step is get off your butt and do something mm -hmm. and don't be afraid to work. Yeah. But um, in, in, in our, our vision of what we want changes. And so it's not like you have to have it right. Right. Just make it clear enough why you're doing it. Yeah. And, and I think, you know, the clarity of purpose, I think is inc incredibly powerful. And it's like your North Star. Is a right? North Star, yeah. Right? Like, okay, like, th is what I'm doing today getting me closer yeah. to the direction? Or is it just a distraction? Yeah. And then I would also say pick a niche. Because mm -hmm. everybody, see, like, Steve has all these businesses. Nathan has all these businesses. Great. Have all the businesses you want. And this is, again, you know, Gary Harper, uh, who's a friend of ours and, you know, business coach. Yeah. But... You have to have one that operates without you mm -hmm. to go get the next one. Yeah, and so you know, ha it doesn't, and it doesn't have to be complex. And the the older I get, and the more in the business I I am, the more I love simplicity. I want it to yeah. be simple because then your team understands what we're doing, you understand what you're doing, and it's very clear what you're saying yes to and what you're saying no to. Right. Um, let's see. We have uh, so are you investor? wants to know, are you in any masterminds right now? I'm not currently in any masterminds. Um, I still have a lot of individual relationships, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, we were in Collective Genius, I think for five years or so, and I uh, just decided to take a break. But um, actually, well, I have like a group of guys to get together. There's mm -hmm. there's some real estate guys in KC. So, I mean, we, we definitely mastermind and regularly look at deals, um, just a, a group of people, but it's not a paid you know thing. Yeah. Um, but um, it, a mastermind is an awesome thing. And I'm, I definitely appreciate it as much for the, the, the learning as I do for the, the network and networking. And, and uh, so they're awesome. Yeah. And I think, you know, masterminds, uh, I've avoided them for so long. Like I, I'm in multiple, right? Um, but like when, when, when they reach out to me in CG and, you know, say, hey, why don't you join a collective? Just like, no, nah, I'm good. You mm -hmm. know, like I don't want to take any more time away from my family, which is one of the biggest challenges. Yes, for right? sure. And the masterminds, like you're constantly traveling away from family. Yeah. But it was the best decision I ever made was joining CG, even though I, I, I rebuffed them multiple times. <laughs> joining it was the best thing I ever did. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I think I, I'm with you on there, the, the, the importance uh, of, of masterminds. Yeah. So um, let's talk about like the family component, you know, we're talking about purpose. Mm -hmm. um, how intentional are you as far as work-life balance and so on? Because there are a lot of people say that work-life balance doesn't exist. So I mean, what, what are your thoughts on that? I'm incredibly intentional. Um, so I, every week I have a date with my kids and I, I've, been, I've done much better with my kids than I have with my wife. Mm -hmm. But this year, um, starting out with the bang and even uh, before I left town on Monday, I took the two kids together to um, a movie. So normally I do it like one-on-one, -on -one, but every week um, have that specific time. And 
uh, and also just finding things. So at the beginning of 2000, of 2022, we sat down with the whole family and said, hey, what are the things we want to do as a family this year? And we wrote out a list. And so, um, hey, we want to go to these places. We want to go have these experiences. I uh, want to spend the t- this time traveling together. And so I honestly don't necessarily believe that work-life balance exists. Mm-hmm. I think it's more of the creation of how you spend your time. Yeah. And, uh, and so what my priority in the business was to give me more time to do the stuff I like to do. Yeah. And that includes hanging out with the family. It includes going on trips and, um, and just, you know, where we live and, and being able to have a place that we love to be um, when we're there and, uh, and uh, the opportunity to go to places we want to be. I like the idea of sitting down with your family and like planning, like what you guys want to do. And I think this is, doesn't matter where you, what season you are in your business, right? Like you are in a season in your business where you have a lot more freedom, yeah. right? Time and financial. Uh, I am in a situation where I have a lot of financial freedom, not as much time freedom. Uh, but for a lot of the guys right now that are listening, they might have no uh, time or financial freedom at the moment. You can still sit down with your family and plan. Like, here's what we want to do this year. Here are the goals for this year. Yes. And block it out. Because one of the things that happens is, if your family's bought in, they're more understanding when you've got to step away from dinner to take the calls. Because these are the tough things you have to do when you're early in your business. 100%. You have to leave the dinner table to take a call. And it sucks, right? You mean your girlfriend or wife may be rolling her eyes. It's part of being an entrepreneur when you're starting. Mm-hmm. But if you take that time to actually sit down with them and, and, and get buy-in from them yeah. and do something together, it's like, here's what we're going to do together later on this year. But I can't do those things if we're not operating as a team right now. Yes. Well, and even like, you know, so our family loves to go to Florida. So let's say, you know, I can't afford to fly. Okay, cool. Well, what does the gas cost? 500 bucks? Cool. Uh, you can, what we do every month is we have bank accounts for travel. We have bank accounts for charity and we put that aside. And mm-hmm. so it might be 25 bucks or 50 bucks or whatever it is. Um, but again, it comes to that question. I, I, we can't do that right now. No. What does it take for us to do that right now? Mm-hmm. And, uh, and it might not be going to Florida. It might be going to a you know, local amusement park or whatever it might be. But um, you can make it as a target, and now you know how to get there. Yeah. And, uh, and I think, you know, plus there's joy in, in having that, that um, time with your family. And we had a blast talking about what we want to do and, um, and just being able to include them because then you have buy-in, like you said, and, and then now you can, you know, all right, well, are we going to spend money on this stupid thing or are we going to, you know, put this towards going on this cool trip? All right. Yeah. You can, you have a, a part, again, having a North star. Yep. Helps you figure out, is this getting me closer to my goal or not? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, so not a scam, another great name. Uh, what do you think about regulations that are coming in regarding wholesaling and assignment fees? Um, well, you know, it's interesting because, so I, it's a great question. I've never been a wholesaler to be clear, um, but I've bought from a lot of them <laughs> mm-hmm. and I have a lot of them that are friends. So I, I think that um, some regulation is actually great. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that to prof- help professionalize that, that area of our business, because there are a lot of people who do operate that don't know what they're doing. Yeah. And it's very clear when you get into a deal with them, um, what's happening. And so I think for the, for the, you know, when you think about like a realtor, um, you have to have a certain, uh, education. It's not much <laughs> to be clear. Uh, but, um, you know, and th- there's a, this is a certain level of, of what we have to uphold as a, as a licensed agent. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and I, I think it's a good thing. So I hope, yeah. and I don't think it matters how much you make, you know, and even as a buyer, I don't care how much you make, but I want to make sure that the information is clear and that those sellers were, you know, treated reasonably and, mm-hmm. and, and, um, honestly. And, um, so I, yeah. I'm happy for that. Yeah, I definitely disagree, okay. but uh, I think it's going to happen, right? Yeah. Uh, because we're not self-regulating, and yeah. I think that's the biggest problem, right? Like, I think if we were self-regulating and calling out bad behavior, that would be totally different, right? That would be totally different. Right. And, and to be clear, I don't think the government does a great job of that either. No. Um, and so, you know, I, I, I'm not excited for that part, but I think something had to change. Yeah. And and so, in the system that we operate in, th- that's a great point. So yeah. I agree with you completely. Yeah. I, I would rather self-regulate Re- much rather self-regulate but it's not gonna happen the government's gonna come gonna. in they're gonna come in with a heavy hand yes and there's gonna be some, a lot of people that are gonna get screwed you know like my, my something i said before my biggest concern my biggest fear is i've been making these videos right like how we love drug dealers and honestly we do um <laughs> yeah they're, they're great hustlers right yeah. uh, but my biggest fear is there are a lot of guys that did you know things in the past they're regrettable yeah right and they've got a record and now 
they're doing something which is legal. Yes. But it's gonna get regulated, and these are the guys that get hurt, right? Mm. The guys that have a felony are not gonna be able to get a real estate license. Oh, interesting. And now they're gonna be regulated out of the business. And it, th th these are the unintended consequences that occur, yeah. right? If we're not self-regulating, we're not taking care of ourselves. And that, you know, and I hadn't even thought about that. And it's an awesome point. And I do know several people that really have changed their life in an extraordinary way, right? Uh, getting into real estate. And, and so there's that there's a great lesson too right now to say, all right, well, if you see somebody who is operating like that, you know, don't, don't do business with them. Tell and like, let's, let's not accept that as a, as a, um, a real estate profession because yeah. we don't need to do that. Right. And, uh, it was actually, cause kind of ironic, uh, just yesterday, my partner, Max totally blasted somebody on Instagram. I was like, well, maybe that's not the best way to do it, but <laughs> and it's hard, you know, and everybody has their own personality too. Yeah. Right. And, and, uh, so we have to understand like what, again, what is it that we want? Well, we want people that are operating, uh, with integrity mm -hmm. and we want to buy more deals. And so, you know, that's tough, but that's a good point. That's, yeah. a, that's a really interesting point. Um, so Ingrid Hernandez wants to know, are your contractors licensed? Uh, yes. You know, we, <laughs> we use con early on, you know, basically anything goes, um, uh, and, uh, that is, it, it was a disaster. And so, um, you know, and plus as you, as you, we professionalize our business, we have more deals that we're doing. We have a bigger target on our back. You know, you're dealing with cities who all of a sudden, you know, Hey, if you have, one project going on and you're you're not running a professional contractor or pulling a permit or something like that you know what are you gonna do get your hand slapped well hey you have 30 they're gonna go through every one of those houses mm -hmm. uh, and figure out what's going on so yeah we, and they could put a pause on everything yeah yeah so uh, we did not mess around with that what uh what was your worst situation on this letting everything let, let anything go with contractors <laughs> what was the worst story oh man oh well, I don't know if it was just a contractor story, but I, I remember one, we, we've had a few uh, self-inflicted, uh, but um, it, this wasn't necessarily the contractor's problem, but we bought a house uh, that, was, that was a triplex. And um, we uh, had gone, gone through almost the entire renovation. And a neighbor uh, calls us in, because I don't think we, we had not pulled a permit. And we're like, oh, great. so. Uh, the actual work was pretty good in the house, but um, so we get we we put them off, put them off, put them off. They come in and they're like, well, you know, actually everything's not bad. You know, you need to pull a permit for the HVAC or whatever. But by the way, this is not a triplex, uh, and uh, you cannot operate it as a triplex, and y you have to get special permission even to operate it as a duplex. So the only option you have is to operate it as a single family home or go try to get you know variance from the city. And mind you, there is, you know, these are all these like turn of the century homes that, you know, all the way down the street, triplex, 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 triplex. And I'm like, dude, that, like, look at the entire street. They're all triplexes. He's like, well, you can turn them in if you want. Like, you can, <laughs> but we got called in. And so we had to literally tear out two <laughs> entire kitchens out of this thing. Oh, man. Put them back in the wall. Reese, you know, set it up. And, um, but we ended up turning that house into an Airbnb and we actually, crush it with that but yeah. it was an absolute nightmare and going through you know first as a triplex and then as a single family and then as a you know vacation rental so uh for those that are it. listening what is a variance a variance uh, it's basically you have to go to the city and um so we're dealing with a variance right now on a new construction project where um in the code it says hey you have to have your garage this distance from the property line but um you know the entire neighborhood doesn't follow that, um, but because in the code it says that, they're giving us a hard time. So we have to get a variance from the city to approve that we can have a, a different you know distance. And so yeah. There's a lot of different variances you could have, but right. But you gotta get approval from the city saying, from "Hey, the city. Uh, you guys are okay with this now, right?" And yeah. if they don't, then you're SOL. Right, and and that was the other issue, and because in the history of the title, there was nothing that said anything about being a triplex. Mm -hmm. So and that was the other thing, you know, the lesson learned in there is like you're buying something old like that, and it's a triplex. You know, you might want to talk to your title company and make sure you understand uh, if it's actually you know showing up as a as a three unit. Yep. In the city. Uh, so Kai wants to know on YouTube, uh, as someone who's starting in wholesaling that wants to eventually move to flipping, when is the right time to pivot? You know, I, I I love this question uh, in the spirit of 
like it, are you trying to you know change transform your wholesaling business to a flipping business uh, or is it simply like the nature of trying to make more money um, so I like having a wholesale business that that is simply your acquisitions arm to your flipping business and then of course you can sell what you don't want to flip um, but I also would add on to that um, depending on what your what your end result is you can hold some of those things too so um, you know one of the, the things for me I, like what would you do different I would have kept a lot more uh, yeah I would have kept a lot more and so you know everybody selling houses and selling whatever you can always trade up so it doesn't mean you have to keep those same houses you could trade up in 1031 to a you know apartments or self-storage or whatever right but um you know i would say you know i would do it as soon as possible uh but test it right so do one and test it get a little better do one and um and so that way as you're wholesaling off and then say all right cool well we're gonna flip five now but we're gonna keep one yeah and um so the, I, I like stair-stepping those so you you learn small and then you scale big yeah and i like your answer because you're you're suggesting having a wholesaling operation and a flipping operation. Yep. The wholesaling operation still needs to stand on its own. Yes. And the flipping company has to be able to stand on its own. And the problem a lot of entrepreneurs make, or mistake they make, is they'll try to like, okay, well, I'll just flip this as a wholesale. And now we've got this profit on this deal, mm-hmm. but we don't know how much it was due to the wholesale and how much it was due to the flip. Yep. And if you can't, we can go back later on, right? But really you should be wholesaling to your company at the market rate where you wouldn't been able to wholesale it to somebody else for. So then you can figure out whether it was a good flip or not. A hundred percent. But most people just kind of start coll- yeah. it, it, colluding. Cross, or, cross collateralizing. There you go. Yeah. 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 Plus, uh, I I think it, it does. They 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 are um, they do what work very well together, mm-hmm. and uh, you don't have to flip all of them either. So you you can sell some stuff out, and that's great. Um, you know, cherry pick the good ones, and and then keep the good ones too. That you know, if you if you want to, you know, be an owner and holder of real estate. Uh, so one of the first things I learned about you when we first met was that you had just fought your first professional fight. Amateur fight. Amateur fight. Sorry. That's Amateur. Okay. Um, I would argue if there are people there and it's an organized event. <laughs> right, did the people pay to be at that event? Yeah, yeah, for sure. I would argue as professional. I think in a, the Olympic standard, right? If, you, if there's any money involved, it's a professional <laughs> event. Maybe you didn't pocket any money. Yeah. Um, so talk to me about that journey because most people don't want to get punched in the mouth. Mm-hmm. So what was that journey? Yeah, so um, it was interesting because I, so I grew up, I was bullied as a kid. I had uh, a lot of fear around <clears throat> around that. And I, I, I grew up into this body, I'm six, you know, six foot three, weigh a couple hundred pounds, I'm, you know, but do you, I never had the confidence of what that felt like to actually be in a situation as you have a, a, a wife, you have a spouse, you have kids, and uh, and so it, it kind of tormented me for a while. Not kind of, it tormented me for, for for a long time. And I remember when Joe Rogan's podcast, Tim Ferriss's podcast, and Jocko's podcast, and they started having these like Josh Waitzkin and um, other, you know, the Gracies, um, and talking about jujitsu and talking about what it was. So I was like, man, I got to try this out. And so that led me to a uh, jujitsu gym. And I remember... The, my coach, uh, Trey, uh, you know, he's this like fit specimen of a man. And uh, I was like, dude, like, what do you do? And he's like, well, I'm a fighter, you know, like, well, this is pretty cool. So I started doing, um, I started doing one-on-one sessions with him and I uh, started training and, and then started going to the gym and it's actual fight gym. There's now, I think they have, you know, 17 fighters in the UFC at this point in the gym. So I'm regularly training with guys who are, you know, prize fighters in the UFC, right? And uh, not that I was that good, to be clear. I was not that good, but um, I was training. And so it was the situation, uh, much to the displeasure of my wife, I'm sure, uh, that I was actually at a CG event and uh, I texted my coach and I was like, hey, I'm tired of thinking about it. I'm gonna train all this time. I'm not gonna actually do it. Mm-hmm. And I will hate myself for my entire life if I don't. And so I texted him within 24 hours. I had a profile picture of some dude and I was just like sure done I'll take it and so yeah the the it was a promotion in Kansas City I think there I mean there's probably a thousand fifteen hundred people there it's in an arena they, that feels like a professional match uh well they have so in the MMA world they have uh, amateurs and they have professionals got it and so you actually have to have 
a certain number of amateur fights to even get approved to be a professional fighter. Got it. And so uh, it's very much a professional event. The lights are bright. The lights are very bright. Yeah, I spent three three months trying to pick out my uh, my walkout song. Didn't hear it. Um, <laughs> so uh, it's it's quite the experience. So you were trying to handle some childhood. Yeah. Um, situations yeah both the feeling of that as well as the actual tactical like what does it feel like to be mm. in this and let me tell you if you have not trained and you watch you have, you, you have fights or whatever um, people don't appreciate what that training is like I mean the physical nature of your body but also the emotional experience of that uh, so I remember leaving the gym and you know, being in tears because you're I'm a grown man I have a multi-million dollar business and I just got my ass kicked you know for 90 minutes yeah. And uh, and it's brutal. It's brutal. So well, you lasted though. It sounds like so you went it went it went the all the way to the to so the end. So I, I lost the I lost the fight. Uh, but you went to the end. I went to the end. That's and, that's a moral victory. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yeah, losing sucks. Uh, I did not like losing, but mm -hmm. um, you know, and actually a crazy story. So the day before the fight, we have weigh-ins, and um, I ended up at the same facility, sitting in the same sauna as my opponent. So I had never met him, and we walked into the same facility, the same place, and he's standing in this like trash bag suit. Uh, come to find out, he he still missed weight by 12 pounds. Uh, but um, so we sat in a sauna closer than you and I are at this seat right now uh, for several hours. Yeah. Um, the day before the fight. So what did you learn about yourself after the fight? Well. You know, emotional, our emotional conversation with ourselves and the stories we tell ourselves are powerful. And, uh, you know, when you're in the middle of a round in a, in a gym like that with a tough person who's a great training partner, right? So they're going to push you. Uh, there's a lot that you can, that you can do to yourself to the positive or the negative with whatever you're telling yourself. And I also would say, you know, understanding our capacity as a human to suffer there's an incredible amount of suffering that happens uh, in a fight gym. And when you put yourself in that situation and you have some you know, person on top of you punching you in the face and trying to choke you out, uh, it makes you a lot more able to work through difficult situations where they're not trying to punch you in the face mm -hmm. and have both resilience and patience to work through the problem and identify a problem. Just like in jujitsu, right? You have somebody on, like, what is the puzzle piece that I need to solve? Um, you're in striking, you know, what are the things I need to do to, to maneuver and to faint and to, to punch and kick? And so, you know, there's a lot of parallels in martial yeah. arts. So tough it out. Hopefully that answered your question. He's asking about what lessons did you learn from MMA that translate to your business? Sounds like we kind of addressed yeah. that. Or is there more? I mean, th there's, there's a lot, you know, yeah, there's a lot there. Um, but you know, I think, I think also just perseverance and, uh, it's, it's so easy when you see, you know, people who are doing something you're like, um, you know, comparison is the thief of joy, right? We, mm -hmm. we look at other people and we are like, oh man, why can't I blank, 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 blank. And uh, so, you know, <laughs> I'm never going to be in the UFC, but I can work my butt off today and do my job in the gym today. Yeah. And, you know, people, when you, when you look at your business, it's like you haven't created it. Well, you haven't created it because whatever you're doing is not creating that yet or you need the patience and perseverance to continue doing the thing mm -hmm. that will produce the result that you want. Yep. And then you wrote a book. What's it called? It's called, well, so Steve, I want to tell you, because I was, I, I've been kind of putting little nuggets out there. And, um, and so I haven't even like announced the title of the book. I just had a signed um, a book deal with a publisher. So it's called the no quitters guide to investing in real estate and living an extraordinary life. So it very much, uh, parallels that no quitting attitude, mm -hmm. perseverance attitude, clarity of focus, and, and and really awesome, you know, living an awesome life. Yeah. So I'm so pumped to uh, be uh, be getting it out there, and the journey of writing is quite the uh, quite the effort too. Yeah. So it wasn't easy. Uh, well, I wrote the entire book. I hired a coach, okay. <clears throat> and uh, I we did like thirty some thousand words of pre work, and then I wrote the whole book in less than three weeks. Wow. 66,000 words. Wow. I came back to it like three or four weeks later and I hated it. And so, uh, my coach was like, well, you know what, why don't we, uh, why don't you rewrite the, the first quarter of the book and we'll come back to it. And so I rewrote the first quarter of the book and it was 
so much better. She's like, you know, why don't you write the, you know, go ahead and write the next quarter. And I ended up rewriting the entire book uh, a second time in six yeah. months. So that's awesome. Yeah. Uh, Kai on YouTube wants to know, what's the one thing you do to get over mental hurdles? Oh man, it's, that's a great question. It, it is understanding as quickly as possible going from an emotional state to a powerful state, which is what is the problem? Mm -hmm. And um, when we see the problem, like, you know, oh, I can't believe this is happening, right? Boom, now you're immediately out of problem solving. Mm -hmm. And um, so, and also telling yourself, like, I can solve this, yeah. no matter what it is. And so we just identify the problem. I, I am, I'm a problem solving machine. I tell my team all the time, I love problems. I just want better problems. And uh, so when you find a problem, identify it and, and, and create the this, this simplest path uh, that, that solves your problem. Yeah, I, I love the way you, you phrase it, going from an emotional state to a powerful state, mm -hmm. right? Because even just calling it a powerful state, you've mentally empowered yourself right? I'm going to crush this crush problem. this problem. Yes. Yeah. And, and you know, that's, that's a, a thing in and of itself, right? So if you're in that emotional state or um, fear based state, like what are the things you do to get out of that? Mm -hmm. So, you know, for me, I, it's Jocko podcast, dude, I can listen to that dude's voice and I want to go run through a wall. Uh, I can put on some songs, you know, music is a powerful state change, go outside, um, go do something physical, go to the gym. Right. So, you know, a lot of times I think people are like, I hear you, Nathan, but what do I do about that? Mm -hmm. And have a predetermined thing. I already yeah. know. If I find myself there, I know what to do. Here's my routine to transition. Here's my routine. Here's how I get back out of that. Um, have you hooked up or connected with the Echelon Front? Um, I have not done anything specific with them, no. Have you? Uh, I have not. Uh, wait, you connected with SEAL Team Leaders, right? Yeah, SEAL Team Leaders. Yeah. So we just hired them, and our first call is on Friday. Yep. So we got Larry, who's going to whip my team into shape. I remember my first call with them, too. So <laughs> let's talk about that. We've talked about okay. leadership. We're talking about uh, Jocko. So uh, Larry Yatch with SEAL Team Leaders. Yep. They have a, a, a leadership organization, mm -hmm. leadership training organization uh, called SEAL Team Leaders. Yep. So what are some things I should be looking out for? Because he's going to be coming hard. Well, so. you know, it, it's just like everybody, right? So everybody has their own uh, individual style. Mm -hmm. um, Larry is is a, an incredible thinker, and he um, he likes to be very specific with definitions of words, what they mean, and also actions. And and so, you know, it's one of those things that uh, when we got into that conversation with them, they're like, you know, guys, you have like thirteen businesses here, and you have no process in that for for what you're doing and, and they were a great help honestly in the transition of our uh, business from renovations to new construction so we had had them in our office we we work with them quite a bit as well and it's not just Larry too they have a they have a whole team full of rock stars and um, in all different little different skills and so you know I would say not just in in uh, in like that call with them, but they have some tools, both like in giving a feedback, they have an actual feedback workshop, which is awesome. Uh, and they have um, the way they communicate and talk about coordination of action and they talk about um, how you operate. Mm -hmm. It's really interesting. So yeah. I think you will, you will find it to be extremely helpful. I'm looking forward to it. I'm a little terrified. Um, <laughs> what is your biggest struggle right now? What is my biggest struggle right now? Um, right now it is the patience of both for me and the team of working through the remaining renovation projects and seeing this thing that we're really excited about, but also still having to renovate well on these properties. And um, when we have a lot less staff who is responsible to do that job and, uh, and just the patience to understand like, hey, it takes time to do that and it also is not producing the result that we want but because we made that decision that was part of the decision and mm -hmm. that's the patience to let that thing run and then to be able to have full focus onto the new yeah, construction you knew this was going to be difficult yeah remembering that we made the decision that it was going to be difficult correct yeah. yes yeah and also you know even from like a revenue perspective because you know you're used to buying all these houses and you're used to putting stuff in and new construction takes longer so it's the learning and planning of, mm -hmm. of that as well. And not just like, hey, that <laughs> we bought our first piece of ground in 2019, uh, like early 2019. And we thought we were, gonna we were gonna have that house out of the ground 
and uh, CEO, you know, cleared the house cleared by the city in like September of that year. And we got the CEO for that house in like July of 2020. So it's like everything takes longer than you ex than mm -hmm. you expected to do. And just in this situation, you know, and all the things we didn't see that even though we're like this is the decision we're making, but we didn't see this thing. Yeah. And um, so when those things come up, it's it's tough to work through. And one of the things that, you know, when you have to let people go, it's really hard. Um, mm -hmm. it, it's one thing. It was really hard for me to fire people initially. Right. But you kind of get to a point where unfortunately better or worse you know you get kind of jaded and you grow like you realize like well this isn't working is that me like it's you like literally it's you i can't do anything <laughs> about this right but you made a pivot mm -hmm. and you've got amazing people and you know you're not a psychopath yeah right so when you have to let them go i'm sure that was incredibly difficult horrible so talk about that event because that, that must have been um a massive overhaul yeah it was horrible uh, my COO and I sat in a room for two days and uh, cried almost after every one of them uh, with the people because we loved them all. Mm -hmm. They're awesome. Um, and uh, we gave them, uh, you know, some, some runway financially. And we also, you know, I worked very hard to connect intersect people in our market that you know, would be potential jobs, almost all of them, but one within like a week or 10 days had jobs. That's good. And, um, you know, it sucks. It sucks firing people. And, um, but, you know, Jim Collins, good to great, talks about, you know, right people, right seats in the bus with the leader, you know, and talks about level five leaders. Um, I think that's a different book maybe, but. No, it's the same guy. Same book, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, when we realized, and this is something out of that SEAL teams too, is like, we're so clear now on what the objective is as a, t a company that we cannot not make this choice. Mm -hmm. And it's simply a decision now. This, this is the, th there's no longer a seat for you. Mm -hmm. But I love you as a person and you do a great job uh, on our team. And so, you know, we sat there and we had those conversations, um, which is, which is rough. Yeah. It's terrible. But you know what? You made the call. You're the one in that seat. You go sit and have that conversation. Yeah. You didn't do the Zoom thing where you let 900 people go. It's like, hey, you're on the Zoom meeting. That's crazy. You're on the on Zoom meeting. <laughs> yeah. Do you notice he is no longer in that position anymore? Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. He, I think within like two or three weeks, he had taken a leave of absence. And I, I'm 99% sure that dude is no longer in that seat. Rightfully so. Yeah. That's crazy. Yeah. It's the worst way to demonstrate yeah. any kind of compassion. I mean, I get that we are in a for-profit business and we do everything we can to help our people. Yeah. You know, like if we can't support them, we can't support them, but we do everything with our power to do it. Yes. But the callousness. It's insane. One other caveat to that uh, was interesting and SEAL team talked about this as well was as you, the more clear you are with who you are, the people who, who are the hell yes and see the vision, want to be a part of it are there. Mm -hmm. And the ones that are not or don't see the vision or don't, they're not like that tied to it leave and you know we had a number of people after we made that cut who also left mm -hmm. and uh you know it's interesting trying to talk to my team because they're like everybody's leaving like hold up the people are leaving who are not a hundred percent in on this mm -hmm. mission and that's okay right we want them to leave yeah and so you know that, that's a hard place to get in in both compassion for that situation and also the understanding of how to communicate that with your team yeah well and, and if they're not part of the mission you don't want them there right and it's not a bad thing right like no. they, they they have found something that more is more in line with what they want yes it's selfish of us to try to keep them a hundred percent yeah we want them to win yeah. And that's just like the abundance mindset, right? So I, I've had a number of people who, who have worked for me who've gone on and, and built their own company, you know, and um, I'm like, good luck catching up. And <laughs> there's the, there's the uh, you know, um, got to go win. But, um, and also, like, there's plenty for everyone. And it's, it's cool. If you want to go work for a different company, great. You want to go search your own, great. Mm -hmm. um, do what it is that brings purpose in, in, in your work so that you enjoy doing it. Yep. So what is your superpower? What is my superpower? Uh, I think that um, I am a person who is incredibly positive and no matter what the situation is, I am capable and, and consistent with working through whatever that is and, and solving. Um, and I'd also say that it is uh, in, in connecting with people and, and through that having real connection 
and uh, and then you know opportunity and relationship come from that. And is there one book you've gifted more than any other book? I'm a book nut, um, so I, I would say I don't know if I think extreme ownership is one, um, and I also loved Four Hour Work Week. I thought that that book was. Uh, very interesting and there's so many little pieces of that book that help uh, but now yeah I'd say between Jocko's Extreme Ownership Never Split the Difference um, Rich Dad Poor Dad soon to be my book Steve of course um, which Brandon Turner by the way said you don't need to go read 13 real estate books you can just read this one mm -hmm. which was pretty cool that is pretty cool uh, but um, I love Audible also so uh, you can give away a free book to anybody who does not have an Audible account. Mm -hmm. So I try to, you know, in, in any instance, and when there's the opportunity, I, I love giving books like that too. That's awesome. Yeah. Uh, I want you to think about what you want to leave the listeners with while I make just a couple of quick announcements. Okay. Uh, guys, if you got value today, please like, subscribe, share. You know, the more we tell YouTube and Facebook,